The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Here's what the here's my assignment <laughs> for today. And it's kind of unusual because this is not my this is not my style. But God said to prepare for the future supernatural. I was gonna basically how many of you ever remember uh, full gospel businessmen and women's aglow? Okay. The strength of that ministry was the fact that that they gave testimony. Did you know that testimony is better than you saying memorized scriptures? Why? Because the word of God's been made flesh when it's a testimony. When it's a testimony, there is a nature that's attached to those words that accomplishes a purpose that sometimes mere repeating scriptures can't do. Right? They overcame by the blood of the lamb, but by the word of their testimony. In other words, where that word has taken root in you and caused you to triumph over circumstances and situations to where you have a testimony. You pass the test, but it's by the grace of God and it's by resurrection life or the Zoe kind of life of God. So here's, here's uh, two scriptures and then after that, we don't know where we're going to go with this, but uh, we're going to have fun this morning. Matthew 13, 52 and this is in the Amplified Translation. It said, And he said to them, Therefore, every teacher and interpreter of the sacred writings who has been instructed about, <clears throat> instructed about and trained, and that's an important word, for the kingdom of heaven has become a disciple. That's another important word. And he is like a householder who brings forth out of his storehouse treasures that is new and treasure that is old, the fresh as well as the familiar. And we're approaching that time and that season where you may see some of the old brought back to life with resurrection life, but you're going to see new things that you've never seen before. And <clears throat> God really laid it upon my heart that... Uh, we were created as his workmanship and that the key has always been obedience to the assignment. And <clears throat> I'm going to cover some, uh, this is going to cut through perhaps your dreams <laughs> that were imaginary, good intention, wonderful things that you picked and chose, but God didn't necessarily pick and choose them, okay? That can be very selfish. And, there, and, that, and that is in the church, believe it or not. Uh, destiny has come to mean a slightly diminished term. Um, but if you use the word assignment, I think it's going to keep your head screwed on. You are created for an assignment. But now, how do you know what that assignment is? Because we have a tendency to put name tags on it. But I want to give you what, what, how it worked in me. And... <clears throat> Eventually, I'm going to get to that scripture that I say before every service, Philippians 1.6, he who began a good work will continue it. You're going to see where that really came from uh, in the long run, all right? So I'm going to give everything in my life that was supernatural, came about by obedience, and I was clueless. Say that back to me. Dennis was clueless. All I did was obey. Baby steps of obedience produced it wasn't me figuring out my dream, figuring out what I wanted to do with my life. It was baby steps of obedience, but, but it was like it unfolded. Now I want you to hear this. Are you ready? Anoint your ear to hear, because all I really want you to hear is it's not all about Dennis. It's all about obedience to an assignment, not figuring things out. As a matter of fact, I'm jumping way ahead, but when I pastored my first church, I had pastors come from all over 
the country to copy what I did. And I didn't know what I did. I just did one baby step of obedience at a time, and then God produced it. Doesn't it say he's going to build his church, not you? Right? Now we want to cooperate. All right, so here we go. Anoint your ears to hear. Say, okay, I've got to hear something because Dennis is going to talk all about all this stuff that he did. All right. <laughs> but it wasn't me. It was baby steps of obedience. Okay, first of all, 20-some years old, I'm smoking pot and making fun of Pat Robertson on CBN. When suddenly I got stone sober, stone, no pun intended, stone <laughs> sober, and he on the television said, there's someone right now that needs this word, and it was like the whole world was shut out and he was pointing to me. And I said what we would know call as the sinner's prayer, and a great composure came over me. I took my marijuana without any instruction, just feeling led. I had been saved a matter of minutes. I took my marijuana over to the garbage disposal. Of course, there's another voice over here on this shoulder. He's going, why don't you sell it? Don't dump it, stupid. <laughs> sell it, get some money for it. Don't just dump it down the drain. But I dumped it down the drain. It's something about obedience, huh? Doesn't mean there won't be an argument. Obedience means you probably will have an argument. Obey. I dumped it down the disposal, and I basically got a hold of a living Bible. Now, I had about a second grade Catholic education background. <laughs> I went to Catholic school for the first and second grade. That's all I knew. That's, that was the extent of it. And after four months of reading that Bible, I came up to one conclusion, four months it took, of reading the Bible. I was a real, nobody even probably knew I was a Christian. But four months, it was, this is the way we were meant to live. This is the way all people were meant to live. I didn't know that we were meant to live like this. But this is right. There's something in you knows it's right. Suddenly, right from wrong made a whole lot of sense and it wasn't complicated. That this was right. And I'm going, I don't know what to do. And I heard about this place, and it probably helped with my Catholic background. I heard of this church 25 miles away that Catholics, nuns and priests, and Protestants were meeting together in the same church. Praising and worshiping God, Catholics and Protestants. I had no place to put that. So I wanted to go see. So I went, and the television was enough of an experience for me, but yet at the same time, for four months, I didn't feel nothing special except this is the way you were meant to live. I go to this church, and there, they're doing weird stuff. They're going like this with their hands. The horse and the rider fell into the sea. I remember that one. And I'm going, the horse and the rider fell into the sea. I don't even get that, whatever they're doing. But they were all doing it. And they had an altar call. And this is the honest truth. My body, I'm holding on to a pew and I don't want to go, and the altar calls to come forward to accept Jesus. And I'm going, I already accepted Jesus four months ago, and I know that I did it right because the guy pointed a finger, and I got stone sober, and all of a sudden, you know. But I, it, this is exactly what was happening. My body was going forward. So what did I do? You're going to hear this word a lot. Obey. Did I know what I was doing? No. Did I obey? Yeah. I finally went and go, I'll figure it out later. I went up to the altar. 80 people answered. I mean, they were, this is in the 70s and people were uh, getting saved left and right. And God was ignoring denominational lines. He wasn't tearing them down. He just ignored them. All right. And I went forward 
And this guy said something, and I'm going, I, I, and I'm telling him, I'm already, I'm already saved. And he goes, well, and you probably need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going, mm, I have no idea what he's talking about. Mm, uh, okay, and he prayed for me, and I went back to my seat, and I didn't feel any different. Uh, but on the way out of that church, there was probably a thousand people there. But out of the way out, I saw a young man go, I knew you'd be here someday. I had physically thrown, I, sh I managed a shoe store in my 20s. And he would come in and tell me about Jesus, and I physically kicked him out of my store. Because the manager across the way, who was older than me, said, uh, Dennis, that's not the way a manager acts. You don't take somebody bodily and throw them out of your store. I'm going, well, that guy comes in all the time, and he's always telling me about Jesus, and I'm tired of it. I knew you'd be here someday. That was 25 miles from my house. So I don't know, this guy probably prayed for me. If I, even though I threw him out of my store regularly. But I had only read, read one book apart from that living Bible. And it was a book that my dad didn't want. He was blaming uh, Christians for forcing their Christianity on him. And he had a book. Uh, about gambler, a former gambler. And he was on the 700 Club and wrote his testimony. And apart from the Bible, that was the only book I ever, I ever read. And he gave it to me because he didn't want it. And so I read it, and it's about this gambler, okay? So after four months, and I got prayer in that church, which I have no idea what that was because all these 80 people went forward and, and uh, there was a, a, a bald pastor there who played a, a, grand, a baby grand piano and people went forward. And the time I went, I know there was at least 80 to 100 people went forward. That's how many. And that was a regular occurrence there. But I go home and I'm thinking, I got to get a little bolder. I'm a little bit chicken. Um, I'm going to my parents' house, and I'm going to tell them that I'm a Christian. Yep, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go tell them. I'm tired of being a, a fraidy cat. You know, it's time that I got bolder with this. So I go rushing in the door, and nobody's home. So I went up into my old bedroom, and I say, God, all I can say is, I'll do whatever, but I know that this is the right way we were meant to live. That's all I know. This was the way people were meant to live. And suddenly, in my mind's eye, but it was very powerful in your mind's eye, it wasn't like imagination, I saw Jesus flooding me from head to toe, worshiping the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was like instant trinity, understanding experientially all three as one. And I had in the air, right out here, eyes open, no mind's eye stuff. I hear a lot of people's visions of mind's eye. Yeah, 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 I understand all that. This was outside, what we would call an open vision, where your eyes are wide open, and there was letters of light. And I read it with my mind, because it was in English, duh. <laughs> and I read it with my spirit at the same time, which totally, totally annihilated me because I never saw anything like this. And those letters spelled out the name of a bookstore, Grand Book and Bible. It was a Christian bookstore. I had driven by it many times. It was in a strip mall, but I'd never been in it. And that light was so real, Grand Book and Bible. And it was out there and I read it. I was so shocked that I thought, you know, you get mixed thoughts. I'm losing my mind. I just saw a Bible. So I know where that's at. I, well, what's that supposed to mean? Wow. I'm, oh, man. But I haven't taken any drugs in a long time. Now. And, and, you know, I'm going through all this stuff, and it's like, I, I, I just got to know what this is. And then I had a living Bible there, and I opened it up to, to Isaiah chapter 1, and the page, and I'm telling you with my eyes wide open, the page went blank, but for one word, obey. I don't know where it's at in, in Isaiah, 
I had Jennifer look it up because I said, that's 42 years ago. But the page went blank. One word, obey. Oh, grand book. Oh, I'm supposed to go there. Oh, 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 Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I'm losing my mind. And I'm driving in my car to this Bible bookstore, right? And I'm going, oh, Jesus, oh, you're losing your mind, Dennis. You're losing your mind. Maybe it's withdrawal of some kind. But, but, if, but the joy was so strong, I want to stay that way. I don't want to, if I'm crazy, I don't ever want to get sane again. And, and you're going back and forth. But what are you going to tell people? People are going to think you're nuts. Have you ever heard of this happening to anybody? And I hadn't heard of nothing like this happening ever to anybody, ever. Do you know what the kind of a shock that is to your system? But I only had one word, obey. So I pull up the grand book and Bible, and I'm going, this is where my instruction left off. Obey. So I'm assuming that means go in. I go in in a daze, and I'm fighting back crying because the, 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 the power of this was so strong, and the joy was good, but it was mixed with, oh my God, what's happening to me? I never heard of this kind of stuff. This stuff doesn't happen, and why me? This should happen, to, and listen to this, this should happen to popes and cardinals, yeah. bishops maybe, but not Dennis Clark, druggy. all right? This, this, I, I couldn't rat. but anyway, I don't want things, I better obey. So I went inside, and now my instructions stopped. I told you, you're going to get a lot of obedience here. The instructions stopped, what do I do? Well, I got religious real quick. I went over and browsed in the books like I was reading. But I was so shook up, I don't, I, was, I don't know what I was doing. And a lady came over and grabbed me by the arm. I can't, and this is significant. She grabbed me by the arm and she goes, uh, are you looking for something? And I'm going, I, I, I'm just browsing. She goes, I've got the perfect person for you to talk to. And I looked over and there was a book signing and it was the guy who wrote the only book I ever read that was Christian. The gambler turned to Jesus. And I'm going, and she's good. She takes me over by the arm to meet him. And I go, hi. And I'm going to go, I'm going to take a chance. I was sitting in my old bedroom, and this light came on, and Jesus was sitting there, sitting there and I saw this light, and it said, go, go to the grand book of Bible. Totally terrified him. <laughs> and he went, well, you need to come to the CBMC, which was Christian Businessmen's Luncheon. And he handed me the card, and I just kind of walked out. And I'm going, oh, oh, man. That, that I blurted out everything that happened, but then... There was days of joy that were so powerful, I knew that this body could not handle heaven. We would have to have a new body. But at the same time, I have zero explanation. Nobody has ever tutored me. No one ever told me what to expect this. Nobody ever told me what's happening, except that I wanted to stay this way, but I wanted answers at the same time. Wouldn't you? Huh? I mean, I don't care how much joy there is, and how much you feel like you're exploding, I still want to know what's going on. If I'm losing my mind, I already agreed I was going to stay this way. But I just went, somehow I, I, I just got to, I got to, I got to tell somebody. I've got this joy and I, and I could feel a boldness to talk about it, even if they thought I was crazy and locked me up. So I stormed to my mother and father's house again for the second time, and I'm going to tell them. And I went there, and there was nobody home. I went up into my old bedroom, opened up the Bible. But before I did that, uh, at my mom and dad's house, they had a magazine rack by their fireplace. And I glanced down at the magazine rack, and it was uh, Psychology Today. And I looked, and I just read just the cover. I didn't even read the article. I read the cover and some little write-up, and it was about UFO children. 
that brilliant, educated people were going to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship to go to the Father's kingdom. And when I saw Father's kingdom, I wanted to throw up. It grieved my spirit. And I went, oh God, how could someone be so deceived? I know how we're meant to live now. It's Jesus. That's how we were meant to live. Everybody, how can these intelligent people believe the spaceship's going to come to the Arizona desert and take them to the... And then when it said Father's kingdom, it was a perversion of the Word of God that made me nauseous. And I was grieved. And I saw a picture in my mind. Now, this is, for, this is for only for old people, young people. You won't know what it is. But I had a football game when I was a kid. And the football game was electric. It was a sheet metal, green sheet metal with electricity that when you turned it on, you put the little players on and they kind of go. And hopefully you can line them up to actually make a play. But more often than not, something got bent underneath. And you'd give him, he'd have the football and he'd be going. <laughs> Next thing you know, he was going the wrong way. All right. And God basically gave me a picture of that and said, and my impression was that is the way the world is without knowing what their assignment is. A lot of activity. Like, where are you going? Oh, I'm getting there. Well, where, where's there? They don't know. But if you are fulfilling your assignment, your purpose, your God-given purpose, you wouldn't be like one of those people who just kind of, oh, they're moving. They're busy. They're getting there. They don't know where there is, but they're getting there. And they have not followed their assignment, and it grieved me. Now, I had already had too many experiences already, and this is only a little while later. But at the same time, I opened up that Bible. And I'm going, I'm back in my old bedroom again. And I opened that Bible, and Scripture came off the page, not figuratively, literally, in the air, up here. And it was, again, living light. And it was Hosea 3.5. And it was an answer to my grieving. What's wrong with these people? They're trying this, they're trying. But then it was a lot like me. Searched in drugs, you searched in parties, you searched in education. I thought I was, I used to subscribe to like a, a, a 30 different periodicals thinking that I'm going to read a magazine and find a subject that's going to give me meaning. And then I'll pursue it. But I never found in that search. And God was basically saying, Hosea 3.5 came off the pay. Here's your answer to all of that grief that you feel about wayward people, about people not knowing how they were intended to live. Afterwards, it came off the page. Afterwards, they will return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King, and they will come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness in the end times. Afterward, after what? After they've exhausted all their cleverness after they've exhausted all their own ideas that were not bought and got, wrought in God, after they've gotten weary, and in some cases after they crashed and burned, after they tried everything they wanted to try and it wasn't working, you know, a little reality therapy there, how's that working for you? You keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. And I, I just... Too much experience in too short a period of time. I thought I was losing my mind, but again, the joy never ceased. It was so strong. Now, my parents called me Smiley because I was a sourpuss. My nickname was a derogatory nickname, Smiley. The funny thing is, I terrified them because I had this perpetual smile on my face. It scared my mom and dad half to death eventually. They didn't know what to do. And eventually I went and worked in a trucking firm to where it was run by dope addicts. One was supposed to have been a murderer. Another one was a truck hijacker. They pulled knives on me, and they called me Smiley. And they liked me. As a matter of fact, the next person that got my job, they hung him on a hook that takes truck engines out. Because they asked him if he was a Christian. He said, yeah. And then he'd smoke dope with the rest of the drivers. And he'd go, you're no Christian. We had a Christian here. You're not one. And they hung him up. Scared people. 
you know what? You should have so much joy that you scare people. When your smile scares people, that's good. When they pull a knife on you because your smile bothers them, that's a good thing. I, looking back now, I was persecuted for righteousness sake. I was happy. I can't help it. I irritated you. But following days became, again, I fell back into the argument. Why me? This shouldn't happen to me. This, these kinds of experiences, how come I never heard of anybody else having it? You, nobody wants to be a one of a kind in that sense. Like, nobody talks like this, nobody feels like this. And not only that, but I could feel God's presence as a constant. From that day forward till today, discernment is as normative as breathing for me. But I found out quickly that it was not normative, even in Christian circles. All right, but I had to learn that the hard way first. So I'm over there and I'm going, there's something wrong with me and I have, I got to talk to somebody. And I started question, even though it was supernatural, that that guy that wrote that book, he was on the 700 Club and, and I got to blurt it all out to him and everything and he, he seemed like he could handle it, a little shook, but he handled it. And my religion got started to sneak back in there. But you know what? He didn't have a collar. I was looking for authority. He was just a, a lay person who wrote a book. Huh. And I start bawling, and I'm in the car, and I'm driving down, uh, it was State Street, and State Street is loaded with different denominational churches all the way down the street. And I'm crying, and I'm driving, I gotta talk to somebody with authority. And I don't know where to go, and I'm driving down the street, past the Baptist church, past the Luther church, past the Catholic church, past the, and I'm going, I don't know where I'm gonna go. And God's my witness. The wheel turned out of my hands, roughly to the point that my heart I thought I was having a heart attack the car turned into a Presbyterian church parking lot and I'm going oh I can't take this I'm, here I'm, I'm questioning all this supernatural stuff and now it's still happening and it's not letting go and it's been a whole week and I don't know what I'm doing I think I'm losing my mind I don't know but I want to stay this way so I went and I'm in the parking lot I got religious already. What did I do the last time that happened? I went in. So I went in this Presbyterian church. I saw pamphlets that said born again on a rack on the office wall. So I walked over and I got religious. I'm browsing. I'm not reading anything, but I'm going, this is, this is what happens when you do crazy stuff and you, know, you browse. What happened again? A lady, secretary, grabbed me by the elbow, just like in the Christian bookstore. I have, you have questions, don't you, young man? I go, yeah. You can tell how long ago it was, young man. You have questions, young man, don't you? And she grabbed me, I've got the perfect person for you to talk to. She takes me down the steps, and there's two men with collars. One was the evangelical, one was the uh, uh, Presbyterian. And, there were two and I wanted authority, right? Found out later, he was a spirit-filled Presbyterian minister that was quite, quite famous. But anyway, I went down there, and as soon as I saw the co collars, she goes, we have a young man here with some questions. And I went, and I, went, I, went, I went over to this church 25 miles away. I went to this church. I went up to the altar uh, uh, like this. And then I went, uh, then I went home. And then I was in my old bedroom. And then I opened the Bible. And, then out come the, and I saw the Jesus of God like this. And then the letters, I go to Grand Book and Bible. And then it said, uh, the, the, see, see this man? And he read the oil. That was the only book I ever read. And I, I read that book. And he told me to go to Christian business. He goes, he goes, son, do you know who I am? Uh, I don't know who you are. He says, I'm the pastor of that church 25 miles away. He was here visiting a friend. He says, and I want to tell you something else. I have a habit that when people come to the altar, I pick out one person. And I pray for them while, I, while he plays their baby grand piano. 
You are that one person. And you know what else? God said, you're going to see this young man again. And that's when he said, I've got a word for you, and I say it every Sunday. He who has begun a good work in you will continue it. Amen. And that it was really just the beginning of all of the miraculous. It was basically, by the way, that, that lady that grabbed my arm, she became part of my church many years later when I passed her. But anyway... I, when I blurted out the whole thing, he says, do you know who I am? And, and for those of you that may know, his, his name was Leonard Evans. He wrote the book on love, 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 and he was very key with Larry Tomczak and other uh, instrumental in the, during the charismatic renewal of Catholics and Protestants and, and uh, coming together, a very, very famous man. I didn't know it. He was a Princeton professor who basically was a professor's professor, but he was... He was, his heart was ripped because he had a secretary that the brilliant men would come and talk with him. But when the brilliant men came and talked to his secretary, they would cry until he wanted what she had. So brilliance isn't really the end of the road, is it? Well, it's going to be a heart transformation. So anyway, I said, and then, and then I saw that guy, he didn't, but he didn't have a collar, you know, like you guys. <laughs> and he didn't have a collar, he told me to go to Christian businessman's lunch. And, and, and he goes, you know, son, I think you should go to that Christian businessman's luncheon because that particular one, I'm the guest speaker. <laughs> and I consider this chapter one. This is simply chapter one. And... What I'm saying all this for is because if I get through this, I'm believing starting Pentecost is chapter four for me. And if it's for me, it'll be for you. Chapter four of the supernatural. And God basically said, talk about the supernatural so that it's not such a shock when the supernatural starts happening. And you know what? You may not know how the supernatural is going to happen, just like I didn't. And you might not know, you might think you know. But you don't know. Chapter 2, I was in a friend's house. I was getting a reputation as a lay person, a year old in the Lord, maybe less, that I was being called a counselor. And people were sending people because they got better. And I didn't, never saw it as a counseling. I just saw it as really discerning their human spirit as to where they were at at any given point because I found out that discernment for me was like a constant, and it still is. But a constant discernment means you can tell if there's any duplicity between the words spoken and the nature that's attached to the words. And you know, real counsel is basically getting your heart right, not your head. You can say the right answers. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. It's the heart of the matter that are always matters of the heart that are going to facilitate change. Now, in chapter 2, I'm, in this, uh, I'm getting this reputation for one-on-one -on -one, uh, people. I wasn't soliciting. I'd never advertised. It was just word of mouth. People were getting changed lives. And in those changed lives, they would tell someone else, and someone else would come. Um, I can remember one time Jason was uh, a little boy, and he was, he was saying, Hey, Dad, uh, you have an appointment? And I'd say, Why? He was a very strange person walking in front of the house back and forth. <laughs> So strange was kind of like the name of the game for me. Okay, so strange person, let's see what's up, you know. But anyway, chapter two was I was in a person's house and I went into a trance. It was the first and most significant trance because if I'd have read that in the Bible, I don't think I'd have known what it was until it happens. And that's the way a lot of supernatural experience is. Until it happens, you, you, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was in their house, and God basically, I was looking up at a stained glass window. And it had a dome on the top, three panels, and then the windowsill. And in that vision, God says, that's how you're going to plant the church. And that vision was so implanted that all I did was obey it 
not knowing what I was doing. And years later, many people came to copy the infrastructure. But in simple terms, all the dome represented was a corporate atmosphere like the Tabernacle of David. It's like everybody in the room should be experiencing love, joy, forgiveness, and the capstone was with shouts of grace, Zechariah said. All right, I'm not gonna get into detail. But it was atmosphere was the dome. The foundation was no other foundation other than intimacy with God. There's no other foundation other than Jesus. The next one was the ways of God, Beatitudes, pro, uh, Proverbs, learning the, how God does things, learning the ways of God. Then there was the uh, foundational teachings of Hebrews 6. Then it was built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the three pillars, the primary pillar was worship in the word is what we would call it. But the primary one was intimacy intimacy with God. The second pillar was transformation. That Dennis, you call, I called you to build a church not on information, not on much study. And just like a Harvard graduate that I discipled, brilliant young man, he said, the education of the mind comes through much study. The education of the heart comes only by the anointing of God. And God says, the second pillar is transformation where it's only the kind of change that comes by the anointing of God, not by information. And thirdly, what we would call evangelism was, no, demonstration. In other words, this gospel that you're going to teach, preach, and infuse into the lives of people, if they're truly transformed, they're not going to give lip service to the gospel. They're going to demonstrate the gospel. That's when this gospel of the kingdom is demonstrated throughout all the world, not just preached. Because if you're preaching it and you're not living it, what, what, where's the power? Where's the authority? The authority is going to be in demonstration. And then out of the base of that temple will flow rivers of living water. And I eventually built a dome church. Not that that was necessary, but that was God using it to fortify the teaching, to equip a people that basically pastors came from all over to copy the infrastructure and now the infrastructure's changed radically. Now other people do that. I paid a price for it all. Now it's kind of commonplace. Now I'm not even interested because God's doing a new thing. A pioneer's you go forward into new territory. And God's basically equipping you for the, for the marketplace where you spend 99% of your life and small groups of accountability, which is going to be the backbone of the future church. It's going to be the, the reason that they failed. Matter of fact, the... Uh, there's going to be a free download. We were on SID with our new book, and there's going to be, with the book and with the CDs, there's going to be a free download on, uh, change the title a little bit from what we've, we're accustomed to. We're small groups that go deep. There are going to be small groups that work. Because historically, once they removed accountability, they became Bible studies and prayer groups. And history also shows it didn't work. It's nice. Prayer groups and Bible studies are nice, but it doesn't work as far as accountability, which was the structure that was maintained. So basically, God's taken me through the foundation of intimacy, patterns and principles, foundational doctrines, biblical leadership of how we built everything up, the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, reality, transformation, and application. See, we're a how-to application not just lip service. And when we travel church to church, the revelation that we got what? Is people could quote, decree, and declare the word far better than they could live it. The application was lacking. The knowledge was there. So there's a whole story behind all of that. Everybody in the room, it was like the tabernacle of David in my first church. Everybody participated, but it was all for in the building. 40 flaggers, 40 sign language like Jennifer does. Every song that changed, a different person would come up and sign. Everybody was activated in the building. And then God said, of course, I paid a price for dancing and prophecy and all of that because I had intercession, warfare, flags, all of that. Now it would be acceptable. But God is saying now, now the equipping is with the accountability groups for the real world. That tells me there's something coming to make ready a people prepared. We do what God says by obedience. I didn't have to know what it was. Although I do know that equipping them inside that building, even though that was their gift was only good for inside the building, it built character. And in the marketplace, 
it came out. It brought them character development that had advanced them even in their assignment in the world. So that was good. Now, chapter 3. After all those years, I resigned the ministry, went through a divorce, and I had one word. Buildings paid off. Uh, everything I had worked for is there, and I'm leaving it with one word, go to Charlotte. I know nobody in Charlotte. I'd never been to Charlotte, and I had one word. How many of you think you would leave everything and obey with one word like that? Hmm? I know Greg did because we gave him the same word. <laughs> one, Charlotte. And when I got here, there was no plan. I drove into Charlotte, and on the way here, I got a vision of, you remember the old Ponderosa movie? The map burst into flames for the Charlotte area, the whole region. The map, like the Ponderosa map, burst into flames. And basically, I drove, and I got to Polk Street, and I, did, I got lost. I had to get off exit one, because if I, didn't, if I went any further, I wouldn't be in Charlotte. So I get off, I got lost, and I look, and there's a playground, and a couple cars parked, and I drove in to ask for directions, and a guy rolls his window down and says, you're going to ask for directions, aren't you? Because God's had me sit in this car and told me not to get out. How's that for divine direction after you just drove to a strange city and you didn't know? Then I go to a restaurant, and I'm going to have my last meal. I have $3,000 to my name and no job, no ministry, no plan, no logical solution, no manipulation. And I went in the restaurant, I would have this great dinner at the, you know, what was that? Olive Garden. And the waitress comes over and sits down. Waitresses do not sit down with you. That's against the rules, right? She sat down momentarily and said, I just got the strongest impression. Are you thinking of relocating into this area? A waitress. Don't they usually just take your order and mind their own business, right? Are you thinking? I just want to tell you a quick story. She told me about something, uh, I'll skip the story, but she just told me about her friends and how they ran a place in Rock Hill and, and da, 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 da. And then got up and left. And I'm going, that guy that was asking for directions, I said, I know of three churches in this area. So I'm going to find my church first. I don't have a plan. I don't have a job. I'm going to find my church. And the, I knew that there was Randall Worley had a church at Life Spring, Mahesh Chavda, and, and uh, Morningstar. And that's the only three that I knew. And so uh, the person in the car gave me the directions to Morningstar. So I figured I better find it on a Saturday. You know, don't wait till Sunday, go looking for something when you're directionally impaired. And you're in a strange city. I drove, found Morningstar. They were on Presley at that time. I walk in, and I'm going, Bob Jones comes out of a back room. It was actually just a meeting for ushers or, or something. And he came out of the room, back room, and he walked up to me, and he went, you need to be here tomorrow, and then walked away. So, well, that answered my question as to which of the three churches I was going to go to, wasn't it? God knows the exact time and the exact place in which we should live. Amen. And he even sent a Russian missionary to affirm that after I went to a morning star service and said, God has given me a word for you that he has appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. Acts 17, I think it is. So, I had one verse of scripture. One. What was the first thing I learned out of Revelation was obey. <laughs> One verse of scripture, the city, Jeremiah 29, uh, 7, or something like that. The city in which you've been taken captive, pray for its peace, for in it shall be your peace. I got, the only instruction I got is I've been taken captive, God sent me to Charlotte. 
I'm going to Morning Star. I've got one scripture. Pray for the peace. Okay. I looked around and I said, do they do intercession here? I'm going to pray. And I found out that they were meeting in another building for intercession. I would go to intercession every day. And I didn't really meet anybody for all the time that I was there, but I was interceding. And I was getting a lot of insight that was basically being transferred back to whosoever. But I'm interceding, interceding, interceding. And then all of a sudden God said, they were going to do a, Morningstar was going to do a conference in Jacksonville, Florida. And God says, I want you to go. And I'm in a worship service arguing with God that it wasn't good stewardship. I have limited funds. It's going to run out pretty soon. I have no place to live. Okay? And well, at that time, I did have a place to live. I've got to backtrack. So I'm at Morningstar. I'm going to do an intercession, but i got to have a place to stay. I stayed at a hotel, and that, you can't do that very long. Uh, and that's too expensive. And $3,000 will go really fast with $85, $95 a night room. So I'm on the back at Morningstar. has all of these 3 by 5 cards of people that want a roommate. Oh, Jesus, there's the answer. I called every one of them. I was either the wrong sex, too old, not a student, and they all turned me down until finally somebody had a little compassion and said, you know, I have a friend that's got a friend. Here, call this number. I'm in a phone booth. Remember those things? I'm in a phone booth on South Boulevard. And I call this one number. Hello, my name is Dennis Clark, and, and I'm looking for a place to stay. And the power of God flooded the phone booth. And I was getting drunk in the phone booth, and I'm thinking... And the woman on the other says, no, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. Whoa, whoa, whoa. That was on the other end of the phone. Whoa, whoa. And I'm thinking, well, if what's happening to her on that end is what's happening on this end, <laughs> she's got a God, God counter. And she goes, where are you? And I said, I'm on the phone booth on South Boulevard at a gas station. She goes, well, there's a Wendy's across the street. Meet me there in 30 minutes. So I hung around the phone booth for 30 minutes, walked across the street. I met her, and I says, I'm new in the area, and I need a place. She says, you can, have a pl you can have my furnished apartment on Lake Wiley. Furnished apartment on Lake Wiley for $1 if you sign a lease for $1. I signed a lease for $1 to stay as long as I wanted. My next-door neighbor was a medical doctor that was going through a divorce. These were beautiful, on-the-lake apartments, fully furnished. And I would sit and cry. And the dog, so good to me, why is he not? And now, now remember, I paid a dollar, so it's free. And I'm going to intercession, and God says, now I want you to go to Jacksonville and intercede. I don't even know these people. I'm lucky if I know three people. The only person I knew at that time was Rick's uh, assistant. He was an Air Force, retired Air Force uh, uh, John, Holcomb. John Holcomb. And John Holcomb, I told him, look, I've pastored, I've resigned the ministry, uh, but I know it's hard to get help in the church. I pastored long enough to know that you know, the non-spiritual stuff is what usually can't get done. So I said, I'll do whatever. So. God's telling me, okay, now they're going to have, they're going to be in Jacksonville, Florida, and they're going to do the uh, something of David, Heart of David conference for the first time in, in Jacksonville, Florida, and I want you to go and intercede. And, and I'm going, I don't even know these people. And then I'm, I'm in the worship service, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with God, telling him it's not good stewardship because I've got a place for free now. If I go to the Double Tree Inn, I, I'm going to pay $69 a night. But I felt the pressure to go, so I'm, I'm negotiating with God. <laughs> and I'll say, how about if somebody, how about if somebody comes in my room and splits the cost? How about if I find someone to split the cost? Doesn't that sound like a good idea? 
And God went, how about I put someone in your room and you pay the whole thing? And the minute I went, I went, that was a yes. A hand came on, the sh on my shoulder from behind me, and it was John Holcomb. He said, now I know with your background, you might, I have a man who uh, works for Benny Hinn, but he feels God's telling him to go, but he's a little short on funds. Could you put him in your room? My first thought was, he's working. He's got a job. <laughs> but didn't God already plan that beforehand? Huh? How about you pay the whole thing? So we're driving down there, and I'm sharing with him uh, just stuff. And he's getting blown out of the water. And he, he got there. He, he, he ran to uh, uh, whoever was on staff at that time. He went to Rick and all of them. and went, Hey, you ought to see the person I was talking to. <laughs> and everything. And I'm trying to be incognito because I'm a pastor who just resigned ministry. I'm in recovery. And all this stuff is happening. And God's telling me to go to this place. And so, how am I doing? I'm gonna, we're going to make it. Um, and I went he went. And I'm going to just intercede. That's the last thing God told me to do. Ninety intercessors were there from Morningstar, Brownsville, and uh, Paul Zink's church in Jacksonville. And between the three churches, there was 90. And uh, Rick had apparently invited some people who were tape of the month or whatever members to come and intercede with them. Um, Jennifer has this house. She was a doctor's wife, and uh, that's why I got a nice house now. Uh, <laughs> she was a, a doctor's wife, had a house with eight fireplaces and this beautiful thing, and she had a lady who cleaned her house. Whoa! And this lady who cleaned her house was an intercessor, and she told Jennifer, because Jennifer had a 13-year-old daughter that was a little on the rambunctious side. Younger than that? She was about that. Yeah. And anyway, her cleaning lady said, God told me to take you to the Jacksonville conference and to pay your way. And Jennifer knew it was God. And to leave Allison, and to leave Allison at home. <laughs> Jennifer had been widowed for close to five years, and she used Allison as a shield to deter men. And if that, if Alice, and Allison was a good deterrent, <laughs> she was a real character. Matter of fact, when she met me, she was going, now she is genius IQ like her mother. She goes, hmm. She sees her mom talking to a man on the phone. But anyway, she goes, uh, uh, I'm bored. It's a sign of intelligence, you know. And all of Jennifer's friends were sitting around the table listening to her. And I says, I said, well, I said, it's, a, it's actually, if you're bored, it's a sign you're not using the intelligence that God gave you. And all her friends chimed in, he'll be all right with her. He'll be all right with her. He's going to make it. But anyway, I'm at this conference, and I was putting brochures together for Morningstar, 3,000 of them, fold on them because that's the stuff nobody wants to do. And we're, going to, we're getting ready to leave for this conference in Jacksonville. And he says, OK, what we're going to do now is while we're eating pizza and folding these folders, we're going to share testimonies. I'm going, oh, I just resigned the ministry. I went through a divorce. I don't feel like giving my testimony right now. And the first couple gave a testimony was, a husband and wife, we met on a cruise because God told them that she would pray for him and that ask him to pray for her. And I went, uh, probably a pinch sarcastic, but it was more like Isaac's laughter, you know, kind of. Like, when I think of how many people have prayed for over the years, that they would know who's going to marry them because they're going to ask you to pray for her, uh, ask you... 
she would ask to pray for you and ask you to pray for her. I went, <laughs> I got half of a laugh out under my breath. <laughs> and my knees buckled and the power of God hit me. And I almost fell to the floor right there while they're giving testimonies. And God says, and the same thing's going to happen to you. So never make fun of anybody's <laughs> thing. And I went, and I wrestled with that for a long time, maybe someday, but I'm, I'm, I'm messed up, I'm screwed up, I need, I need some ministry, and I, you know, maybe someday. So I go to the conference, and I didn't need another conference. Hmm? I don't know. Oh, yeah. The only way I resolved it with God was uh, through the successes and failures that I've seen in marriages uh, through the ministry, that if they were not best friends... That was really the criteria that kept it together. Friendship. You needed to be friends. Uh, even Jonathan and David, they, they were not married, but they were in covenant friendship. And that's the kind of relationship God wants for all marriages. He wants them to be friends as well. And anyway, so I'm saying, okay, God, maybe someday, thinking years down the road, but my qualification would be friend. So I don't need another conference. So the intercessors were asked, and this just shows you how fleshly we can all be, 90 intercessors, and they wanted 15 to stay in the back room and pray and miss the conference. It was like pulling teeth. I, I volunteered because I didn't need another conference. I was there to intercede. So I'm going to go in this back room with 15 people, and we're going to intercede and miss the whole conference. I know Phil Driscoll was on and a lot of name speakers and stuff, but it was like, I'm going to intercede. So I go back there. Uh, Jennifer didn't want to, but her friend said, we're going back to that back room and intercede. All right. We're in that back room, and I'm praying in the spirit, and I'm walking, and all of a sudden Jennifer is behind me praying with somebody, and just her voice, my knees buckled. And I'm going, oh my God, here I am in a strange city with strange people, and I'm losing my mind again. I'm having these supernatural things. My knees are buckling. And God's saying, that's her. I'm going, oh, no. Oh, my. I don't even have anybody. All my life I had six pastors that I met with on, on a weekly basis, and now I've got nobody, and I'm losing my mind. Oh, great. I feel like I'm in Ghana somewhere, and I must have drank the Kool-Aid because I don't have nobody to talk to, and I don't know what's going on. That's, that's her. Oh, God. And my knees buckle as I heard her. And then I remembered that little thing, the same thing's going to happen to you. Guess what she does? This is the woman who, during her... Widowhood, always hid behind Allison, walks over and goes, and I want to pray for you. Well, my inside just about fell out. <laughs> because what was the little thing? I'm going to pray for you, and then she's going to ask me to pray for her, and that's how you're going to know that's your wife. Well, I already knew my knees buckled, but I am, God's going to do this all by himself because I'm not going to cooperate a whole lot. <laughs> so she wanted to pray for me. I go, okay. Like, oh, I've got so many better things to do right now, but I'll... I'll I'll let you pray for me. And she prayed for me. And she didn't say, and I want you to pray for me. It's like a little smug. I go, if that was God, well, I know it was God, my knees go, oh. but if that was God, he don't make mistakes. And she didn't ask me to pray for her. So then they had 90 seats reserved for intercessors in the front row. So eventually we go back out and someone had peeled two of the reserved seats off. Out of 90, there was two people who didn't have a seat. I looked over, it's that woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it gets worse. It gets worse. <laughs> it's a... We sat down together in the back. In the back because there was no more reserved seats in the front for the intercessors. And I looked down, and she had all these rings on her finger. And I went, oh, she, oh, there's such a sigh. She's married, for goodness sake. Oh, and she was with her friend, and I'm going, oh, she's married. Relax, okay? You're not having a breakdown. You don't, yeah, that's not your wife. You don't have to marry her. Oh. And so 
now I'm getting a little cocky and I'm going, I don't know nobody here but her and her friend. I said, uh, Yankee says you, we don't say y'all. So you is plural. I meant her and her friend. And I said, so uh, you want to go to the steakhouse after for lunch? She goes, oh, I haven't gone out with a man since my husband died. <laughs> I go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so she says, but yeah, me and my girlfriend, Gloria, her intercessor friend, we'll, we'll go. So we went. We went to the steakhouse. And I'm, I'm getting a little relaxed now. But I'm still a little tense because now I find out she's widowed. Uh-oh. And then I kept my composure pretty good up until this point. She says, and when we get back to the building, I want you to pray for me. <laughs> Color drained from my face. And I'm going, I am not going to, I am not going to. She's asking me, what happened? What happened? What's wrong? What did I say? What did I say? I go, I ain't going to say that. Well, you're my wife. You know? <laughs> and she wasn't going to let me get away with not saying anything. And I'm going, I can't, oh, Jesus, help. Oh, Jesus, help. And then that word, friend. She's not letting me go. She's not going to let it go. So I said, all right. I told her the story about the two couples from Hawaii that basically were going to get married. Da, da, da. She'd pray for him and he'd pray for her. And I says, and God told me the same thing would happen to me, that he would give me a friend. I wasn't lying. That was my character qualification. And she goes, I'll be your friend. <laughs> oh, 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 all right. Then it gets worse. A person comes down from the balcony with their eyes this big. I said, come here. And I said, what? She took me down the hall. Jennifer was praying with somebody in the hall. I had an open vision. I came through the hall and I saw that woman married to you. Well, now I'm done interceding. I'm done. I'm walking the halls. And Phil Driscoll's on the stage. And you know, you ever open a refrigerator and you're not hungry, you're not really looking for anything, you're just out of habit. I'm walking the halls going, I can't pray no more. I can't do this. I don't know what's going on. I'm losing my mind. There's nobody to talk to. But it's, I know it's God, and I know it's God, and I know it's God, and it's being confirmed multiple times over. 3,000 people in this conference, and I'm walking. I open the door just without thinking, and the usher turned and goes, you're looking for your wife, the one with the print dress, aren't you? That's what Jennifer was wearing. I close the door, and I go, that's the door. I think I'm being set up. What do you think? Is there something supernatural in this? But do you see it where obedience is important? <laughs> but anyway, so every place I went home and called her on the phone, Allison put her feet up on the chair because her mother avoided men like the plague. And she's talking to this man for hours on the phone. And finally, I told her the truth because I said, I'm going to either fish or cut bait. I'd rather scare her and get this over with than live with the torment of what in the world's going on. So I told her the whole story. And she goes, let me read something to you. She pulls out her prophetic words that were given almost from the time her husband died. Prophetic words by internationally known prophets. And one of them read my mail more than any of them. There were 17 about a man of God that was coming. And the one that read my mail more than anything was, uh, I've got two boys, and I always wished I had a little girl. And sometimes I'd sneak that in the sermon. You know, like, I love my two boys, but I always wished I had a little girl. And one of her prophetic words was to Allison, Allison, God's going to give you another dad and he's not just going to be your mother's husband, but he's going to be like a father to you. He's going to teach you to drive. And he's going to cry and say, I always wished I had a little girl. 
When I heard that, I was, I was done. And then here I'm afraid that here's this little preteen. Now, the good part was she wanted a dad. That, that was helpful because they don't always necessarily, nobody can replace and nobody's trying to replace. But she had her feet up on the back seat of the car when we were driving out of Waycross, Georgia, going, thank God a man's finally taken us out of this one-horse town. <laughs> and then the story goes on, and we're going to have to close with this, because this chapter then ends with all of the stuff that's happened here with us getting married, supernatural houses, finding them supernaturally, God speaking exact. God has the exact time and the exact place in which you should live, all of you. It's the question, will you obey? Because you can fight it, you know, very easily. But I, I want to encourage you that obedience wins in the long run, that you have an assignment, and you don't have to have it all figured out in advance. The people that I've seen struggle the most in the church had to have the answer before they obeyed. If you would obey in the little things, even baby steps of obedience builds the authority. And then in hindsight, it looks like you planned it. In hindsight, it looks like you did it. Every place we went, they said, you two fit. And we learned later that there was a oneness anointing when Bishop Hammond ordained us and others, uh, we saw that take place. There's a oneness anointing. And that oneness is coming to the church. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And I'll tell you something, there was 500 in that upper room. There was 120 on the day of Pentecost. I can tell you that uh, obedience to the last thing you were told is not the easiest thing to do, is it? Hmm? Terry for me in Jerusalem. God gave me a word this morning. Terry, seven days. Come on. You can do it. Tarry seven days and I will show you what I want you to do. From the first time he spoke that to this time that he's telling you. 500 in the upper room, 120 when the power of God came. What does that tell you about obedience? We find excuses. You two fit. And that landlady told me that God spoke to her in an audible voice when she said, no, I have no place for you to stay. God said, do something for that man now. Uh, after you hear an audible voice, she said, for one dollar, you can stay there as long as you want. <laughs> and she, when I came back and she met Jennifer, she said, the Lord gave me a word. God did not give her for your benefit and you for her benefit. God put the two of you together for his assignment. Husbands and wives, God put you together for an assignment, and you will not fulfill that assignment apart from that. You're going to have to go to some kind of plan B. But God has an assignment. God can fix your mess, but he's got an assignment for you. Why not see the assignment fulfilled? instead of your idea, demanding your own way. I've seen the good and the bad, but I'll tell you what, we're, we're, the, the, the knitting that's necessary is clearly, clearly friendship. You need a friendship covenant. Start thinking of what, you know, people will do for a friend what they won't do for a family member. Then why not get that into a relationship and understand friendship? For we are God's workmanship, created in Messiah Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them, that you have an assignment. Chapter 4. I can't tell you what chapter 4 is because it starts next Sunday. That's what the Lord laid on my heart. I'm talking, these are delineated by my experience. Chapter 1 was my own conversion. Chapter 2. was the building of the pastorate and the training that God gave me. Chapter 3 was meeting Jennifer. But chapter 4 is about to commence for all of us. God is putting a new chapter in your life no matter what your life's been like. And he can restore the years the locust has eaten too. He can fix that stuff. So don't feel like I've lost it. It's too late. It's hopeless. 
right now the prophetic words even have the same kind of continuity that I have in my own heart. It's, there's an encouragement to quit. That ain't coming from God. That encouragement to quit is an external pressure. Apparently it even worked in the upper room, didn't it? That feeling to quit is not God, it's evil, and it will take you down the wrong path. What did it say in the Didache? There's two ways to live. There's the way of life and the way of death, and great is the chasm between the two. Great chasm between the two. And all your searchings, all your ingenuity, all your creativity, it does not impress God. What impresses God is obedience. So, Father, we pray right now for that supernatural. I don't know what supernatural is going to take place in the future, but I know I have a history here, and I only gave you what was clearly supernatural. Not opinion, not just quoting scriptures. I gave you what was real and what God really did. God wants to really do for you the same thing, and it's more important than all your fond memories and ideas and manipulations and all the things that you think you can construe to make your life better. It's the wrong road. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, get everybody on track. Let no one be left aside. Cause the, a, a new level of obedience. Repentance is going to bring us. And what was the scripture that came off the page? Afterward, after you've exhausted all the foolishness, they shall return to the Lord their God. They're going to get, get on track. And they're going to return to the Lord their God and the Messiah their King. And they're going to come trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness in the end times. That's where we're at. That's where we're going, people. And if you're watching by Ustream, the people in Oklahoma and Virginia and Missouri, people that are knit together with us, you haven't seen anything yet because you're, going to, you're part of us just as much externally. Illinois. Connecticut, Massachusetts, all over, there where people have been knit together profoundly with us. Where you're going you're to see a, a beautiful work of the Spirit and the supernatural. We're going to have to get accustomed to it. I didn't make none of this up. Can you tell? Could you tell that God does things the way He wants them? Not necessarily according to a nice, neat package that we would put them in. You seek to obey him, you'll get the confirmation you need. Amen? Amen. All right. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.